But where, where does one start with a description? We'll go with Superstar DJ and then we'll work out in the course of our time together how ironic, we'll unpick that, that. <laughs> how ironic that label is. You have written your fourth book, um, Sonic Youth Slept on My Floor, which is a memoir. Your previous books have had elements of memoir to them or bits of them have. In fact, in, in a way, this, this knits together the three hmm. themes of the previous books and, and delivers a... Well, an astonishing overview of a, of a period of, of British cultural history focused particularly on Manchester that, that I think, personally, historians of the future will be fascinated by. And I say personally because, in a way, I, I don't know how I'd conduct this interview if I hadn't been in crowds that you've been playing to and I hadn't been in Manchester in, in 1988 briefly and then I moved there in 1990. And, and I feel, as a southern pansy, that, that part of that whole cultural movement was was going through my veins. And, and yet, of course, for a lot of the country, they were just watching it from the outside. It's weird, isn't it? It's, it's, it's almost not cultish, but that that four-year period was was quite incredible for everyone who was in it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, 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 mean, I do believe that the whole experience... I mean, if we talk, you know, very specifically about that idea of being on the dance floor, say, at the Hacienda, then... Uh, it, you know, I, I'm often in a room and I'm saying to people, it changed people's lives. And 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 in some contexts, that sounds like a ridiculous thing to say about two or three hours in a big discotheque. But I only say it because there's ev- the evidence is all around me in the people that I meet. Yes. And obviously in Manchester, particularly in the kind of the legacy of the Hacienda in terms of, you know, people like the Chemical Brothers to Southern Pansies like yourself coming up to <laughs> Manchester around the same time, 1988, and and coming up to study and finding the Hacienda and it becoming, you know, their, the, their home and, and the music that they heard in the club becoming, you know, the key to them wanting to be involved and, and getting together and making music of their own. And Laurent Garnier is another example. And the, But there's also designers and there's, you know, and there's, there's all kinds of people from that, that era who that moment on. an astonishing moment which we will explore further i just want to get that caveat in place that you're preaching to the choir on a lot of this but there'll be a lot of people listening and watching who probably pretended that they might have been at spike island as i have <laughs> often done in the past but actually have never never been north of watford um let's begin at the beginning though because you are a, a lot more than just a dj you're, you're, you're kind of um in quite an old-fashioned sense you're you're you're, you're a bit of a renaissance man really uh, I think I'm just somebody who uh, doesn't feel like there's any obstacle. My, one of my big heroes is Kevin Rowland from Dexter's Midnight Runners. And I think that that first album was, was brilliant. And there's a song on that called Tell Me When My Light Turns Green. Mm. And it's Kevin, age 23, asking, when does my life start? Uh, in that kind of, you know, in, in a way, I was at that point, probably around that same age, a bit kind of angsty, but eager eager to make my mark and to say stuff and do stuff and be involved. And around that same time, he formed a, you know, he formed a couple of bands. But I remember Dex's Midnight Runners interview where he, uh, he was being interviewed by somebody and uh, he said, and they said, oh, you go down to London. He said, yeah, but we never, we never pay anyway. We just jump the barrier at New Street Station. And for me, that actually summed up the whole ethos of Kevin and Dexter's Midnight Runners and what you want to be when you're 23, when actually you jump the barrier yes. and you don't wait for the light to turn green, you make it happen for yourself. And I've, and that was what I was like from a very young age, you know, and I started my little fanzine when I was 21. Well, let's go back and, a bit further that. then. I and mean, so I'm that... still, what I'm saying is I'm still like that. Yes. So my default is... There's something happening over there. I'm going to go and see, and if it turns me on, I'm going to contribute and I'm going to participate. You grew up in Birmingham, correct? When, when did these inclinations first start <laughs> manifesting? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't. I mean, it's hard to. I, I mean, I guess they were always there, but I, I, I remember when I first started reading books. Um, I, you know, I was a, I was one of those young guys with. A collection of penguin modern classic novels, you know, Sartre, Camus, all that kind of stuff. But I think it was because it it was actually a reaction against everything else. I, for, as early as I can remember, Saturday night TV, I would sit there and it would be, it ain't half hot mum. Yeah. 
And I'd be like, there's got to be more to life <laughs> than sat in on a Saturday night watching it ain't half part. It didn't resonate, weirdly. It didn't resonate with me. Fair enough. And so I'm like, what What does? Where are the? Where's the alternative ideas? Where's the alternative culture? What's Gosh. the stuff that speaks to me? Yes. And that was, uh, I was 10 or 11. And really? I was and you remember that? Is and it kind and of books got a... became my first way into the world of alternative ideas. And in the 70s, the world... You know, there was a lot of bad things that were going on in the 70s. But in, in another way, it was still, we were still in the 60s in the sense that the sense that you could create an alternative and, and a different culture hadn't been quashed by consumerism or, you know, it was there. You'd walk down the street in Mosley where I grew up and you'd see hip, you know, proper hippies. Yes. You had, and, and I would actually, I, used, I remember I used to follow weird looking people. In the street, that's because a, I that's thought, that's role reverse. Yeah, because <laughs> I thought they would. I thought they would lead me yes. to a place where other weird-looking people were, and I had somewhere instinctively thought that's where I want to be. I wasn't particularly weird-looking, but in my mind, I thought they've dropped out or they've got an alternative view on things, and it's got. As I say, it's got to be better than Saturday Night TV. So I became that kind of just very curious kid, and and. I was too young to go and see music when I was 11, 10, 11, 12, but I could read those books, and that was that was the world. And then once I got started going to see, you know, I remember going to see Blondie play, mm. and I was just 16. And, um, you know, can you imagine being 16 in 1978 and Debbie Harry's there? And, um, you know, it's like it was everything you could ever want. You looked but, 16 for a moment then. <laughs> I felt 16. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all sorts of stuff was pulsing through me at that moment. Um, but, um, <laughs> I, and I, but I remember as well as being wanting to jump up and down and, you know, I remember wanting to know what's going on. What, where, where is she from? Because obviously... In a sense, she was a creature from another planet. Another person was Iggy Pop. I saw yes. around the same time. And I remember watching him in a small club in Birmingham called Barbarella's. And I was looking yeah. at those two and I'm like, they they seem to be em emissaries from another planet sent to me to open some kind of portal. Did, did you feel you were on the wrong planet then? Because the, the Ain't Half Hot Mum's a great line, but it does speak of a... Not a loneliness, but an alien, a cultural alienation. If we yeah, were I mean, I mean, I think lots of people are culturally alienated. Yes, and I just think you realised it quite early. Yeah, I, and 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 I think that I just had, a, a, and that's what I mean about going off and finding the alternative, looking think, for your tribe, looking for the tribe. Right, and I think that I think that the, the, the great thing about growing up in, particularly in a city, any city, is the 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 search for your tribe and often you do find them not necessarily by following weirdos but <laughs> but you find them in venues or you find them in an art house cinema or an alternative bookshop yes. or a boutique or a hairdresser's or something like that you you just have enough of an inkling that there's something else happening i remember talking to terry hall about when he was growing up in coventry and he had a kind of moment of revelation when he went into a hairdresser's and they were playing Roxy music. And, in you know, to a 13-, 14-year-old kid in Coventry, mm. just that kind of little moment was enough to hint, yeah, that there's something else out there. And so instead of being culturally alienated and then kind of falling back into, you know, uh, whatever, self-medicating yes. or, you know, just feeling that you're carrying that alienation around with you like a weight... Um, I think maybe because of that era that I was in, the late 70s, early 80s, which was very energised, uh, kind of, you know, that punk DIY thing, mm. I felt like I can, yeah, I can I can, I can, can get involved and, and build whatever is possible. Uh, and, I, I, and so books and music became that, that yeah, the portal. It's, it's odd for someone to talk about their formative years like that without mentioning school. Um, you went to quite a formal school, didn't you? King Edwards is very yeah. academically rigorous, very, very academic. hard to get into. And I presume very... I grew up in Kidderminster, just a right. few miles down the road. I presume a very regimented school. Or yeah, it, well, I guess it... I, I guess it... Well, I didn't know... and I didn't really know any of the... Oh, of course not. Thing, never did, you know, do. I mean, for me, it was... Uh, I mean, I kind of... I, I, I was a rebel, but I wasn't like. I, I remember kind of thinking. I, part of me wanted to learn, 
like I say, I like books. And there were teachers there who would, I remember a teacher there who introduced me to Pinter and Beckett. Mm. You know, I mean, there were other teachers there who had no interest in that kind of thing, but I just kind of steered clear of them. Um, <laughs> so I just kind of got out of it. What Did I wanted you know to you were clever? Oh. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's a weird one. I didn't know. No, I don't know. I mean, no, because I, I was actually, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was clever at, at all. I felt uh, confused and I felt that, um, as I say in the book, I all, all I knew in my mind was if I read more, listened to more John Peel shows and followed more weirdos down the street to art house cinemas, I could somehow unlock the secret of the universe and then I would be happy and clever. And, um, you know, that goes on. The search goes on. That, so what I mean is I kind of knew... I, I knew I was... I knew that I had, there was a bit of me which was not afraid to be a bit arty. Yes. And I wasn't, I wasn't interested in that. I remember reading... Um, Frank Skinner, right? I, I mean, I obviously he's a West Brom fan like me. I, I, I like, quite like Frank Skinner. I read his autobiography, and uh, in, in it, at various times, he you know he he's an English literature graduate, mm. um, and at one point in the book, he says, at this point, I could quote Gerard Manley Hopkins to you, you know, who's kind of like a, a f famous poet from back in the day. Mm. And then he says, but I won't because I'm Frank Skinner. And I and I was never like that. I was never the kind of person that would want to try and pretend I was someone else or that you couldn't bring, a, you couldn't be a West Brom fan who liked Black Sabbath, which yes. was Frank Skinner and me. But you could also like poetry. You could also like reading Kafka novels. You could, the world of ideas, you could want to know more about Warhol you know, you could watch George Melly programmes on late night BBC Two talking about life in the Chelsea Hotel. You could get into, you know, surreal art. You could get into anything. Yes. If it, if it if, pushed if, a button. If, if it pushed a button like West Brom did or like Paranoid did. That's beautifully put. And and I, I and that's what I wanted to do. And I was I'm and in the book I'm kind of I'm still that person. You are, and you resist. It's, it's, what, it's a hierarchy of enthusiasms that society imposes, isn't it? So yeah. if you really like that, then you're that type of person. Yeah. But I'd never thought of it like that in the way that the impulse is actually the same. Yeah. Whether you're, you know, as you say, whether you're watching your favourite football team get mullered again on a Saturday afternoon or, or whether you're reading a poem that makes you yeah. suddenly feel that your heart is flying out of your mouth. And I also think we kind of, com we're, you know, we are, I mean, we're so complicated as people. I mean, not just us two, but generally, <laughs> generally people are complicated. So how yes. how how are Why you? I pretend not to be. If 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 you're if you only allow yourself a one dimensional life experience, you're not going to meet the needs of your complicated self. So um, embrace it all. What was home like then? Well, it, I mean, home was. Uh, Again, I was <laughs> what what Kevin Rowland described to me as uh, middle class Mosley CND. <laughs> um, I have an image now. I've got, I've got it. <laughs> that's all you need to know. Citroen in the Citroen in yeah, the driveway. But, I mean, I think that uh, uh, my parents were. It was. I think it's interesting for people. Of, I mean, I'm ten years older than you, mm. so my parents in 1963, as the Rolling Stones and the Beatles broke. They had three children under the age of five, so they were never going to drop out. They were never going to be into the, you know, they were pre-rock and roll. Yes, just. And just, yeah. you know, and uh, they're only, uh, you know, they're only, they're only a few years older than the Beatles, do you know what I mean? But that made all the difference. They were at that age and they settled down early. So rock and roll to them was a completely foreign experience. I didn't, you know, I'm not one of those people who can say, you know, oh, yeah, well, I'm Parents, you know, like now, oh, yeah. kids are like, oh, my dad, you know, saw whatever, yeah. Joy Division and Blondie. And you can kind of pass down an education, which obviously the kids will then revolt against and go out and buy shit records. But, or not buy shit records, no, download, download shit something records. awful. Yeah. But, you know, but so I had no, um, for me, it was all an adventure. You know, there were, there were a few books in the house, but, you know, they were kind of, 
the books that, um, you know, every, I think every household had a few books, you know, whether you were middle class, working class, there were a few general books that you had in the house at that time. But um, they weren't readers, really. They liked music, but they didn't. It, it wasn't rock and rock and roll. Wasn't anything. Here's um here's a cultural reference you won't be expecting. Have you ever seen the film Short Circuit? Number no. five is alive. It's a robot that no. achieves consciousness, and and it spends the first half of the film desperately seeking input. More input becomes the catchphrase, and I mm. don't know why, but that's what I'm hearing and and seeing. You just wanted to hoover up anything, waiting to see what would give you the mm. the buzz. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I had a, a, my older sister. Uh, her, her, and then it was like youth clubs as yes. well. I mean, I've talked, you know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not dropping net names all the time, but you know, people like Bernard Sumner, Johnny Marr, those kind of people. If you talk to them about their music experience, none of them talk about home. They talk about youth club. Yeah, you know, they talk about and a youth club, like a kind of youth club that I went to. I didn't go to the one my sister went to because you don't want to, do you? You don't want to cramp her style. She was just discovering guys and <laughs> Bob Dylan. And um, so I went down the road and, and, and you know, we, we, had a, we all went to see Car Wash when the movie came out, you know. But at, there you would, there would be people in... Music was kind of what you shared. Yes. Uh, and so you'd hear lots of different kinds of music. So... So I think my generation, it was, you know, stuff that you heard at youth club. You would pick up clues, you know, and this was all kind of cultural references. You'd be like, um, there's a film called Eraserhead by David Lynch. And it was just a rumour. It was like a rumour. <laughs> it wasn't you couldn't. It wasn't on Netflix sure. or no, you couldn't download course. it. Yes. It wasn't on at the cinema. It was a rumour. And then one day you would suddenly see in the newspaper advert or on a billboard, you know, finally it had come to town. So there was a kind of a search and a, an adventure for that input. Yes, of course. Um, which for me, in a way, it kind of added to it. You had to make an effort. Yes. You know, yeah. it wasn't just there to absorb. So even in just being a consumer of alternative culture actually made you and actually made you active. It's the thrill of discovery. Yeah, discovering these things. And, um, you know, so, and so on a lamppost, I saw an advert for uh, a band called Dex's Midnight Runners, mm. who I'd never heard of, supported by a band called Joy Division, which I'd heard on oh, yeah. John Peel. And yeah. I walked, this is a few months after seeing Blondie, walked into a club a venue, and there was Texas Midnight Runners supported by Joy Division, 75p to see those two bands. Uh, Joy Division just released their first album, Dex is about to. God. So, you know, and that was really that, at that point, I mean, I was, I was, yeah, I was absorbing so much stuff and I was very porous and I was taking it all in and it was having a big impact. And Joy Division made a big impact. So when it came to, you know, what are you going to do with your life? You know, I mean, my parents were like every other parent. Yeah. What are you going to do with your life? I'm going to go and I'm going to go and study in Manchester, and it was down, it was kind of purely based on Joy Division. Joy Division, seriously. In fact, true. how did your mum and dad and feel about that? They, well, I didn't tell them that. They, they I said, them. "Oh, yeah, the, Eng the, the English <laughs> course. I'm like, the, the English literature course is very well thought of." <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, the um, when you went to the gigs, were you on your own? Uh, yeah, I would go on my own if nobody else wanted to come i mean i had a, there was a few people a few kids i used to hang out because you don't come across as lonely and yet we've used the word alienated a lot and you've described a search for a tribe you're quite you were socially confident because most 15 and 16 year olds would not have bowled up at barbarella unaccompanied uh, would they? no they, they wouldn't but then um i, I guess uh i don't know i've not really thought i mean <laughs> the weird thing about writing an autobiography you is that you, you you kind of you you think that you've covered everything you can cover and that and actually you think no people assume that um there's a whole lot of stuff you know about yourself which you haven't written right but actually the, there's not I, I i i kind of have to hold up my hands this a lot of the time i haven't got a, like a bulletproof answer to some of the good uh, bullet Yes. Point answer to some of the questions. No, there's no. And so I don't. I, I don't really know. I just remember thinking that um, 
you know, I, I'm just, yeah, I'm going to just go. Just and, go I, I think I went to see. Well, I remember one time when I, I, I was with a little gang of of uh, girls and boys, and we went to see Generation X at Barbarella's, and I just couldn't. Like, I didn't like it at all. Because it was quite it, a confected. Yeah, outfit. it was quite Billy Idol. Yeah. I didn't, it didn't really, it, you know. And I mean, I was. You well, know. That's a bit like what you said with about the Frank Skinner thing, because they it was almost a lack of sincerity. Mm. It was almost like yeah. they were trying to be something. Yeah. And what we've already established that you have a very yeah. good radar for, we we'll call it artistic sincerity. Shall well, we? you say that, but I haven't finished telling you the oh, story. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, then, well, then in Barbarella's, there was a second room, which was the disco room, yeah. which, of course, us going to see Blondie and Iggy Pop, we didn't, we didn't really venture in that room. And that was only open on other nights, but it happened to be open that night. And I just left the Generation X experience and I wandered down the corridor, which was red. I remember the corridor was, it was all, it was like walking down, a, I don't know what, but yeah. anyway. Um, and there was no one in that room and the DJ played, Can You Feel the Force by The Real Thing? And it just sounded brilliant. Sure. And, and and I'm like, okay, so there's gener- all my friends, oh. Generation X, you know, who were top 20 act probably at that time. And there was this. And, and the, so the two things was, one, I'm glad I went down that, yes. that you know. But also I, it, it opened up that world of club music, disco music. It, it, ch- it kind of changed my the sonic, my yes. appreciation of sonics. And I previously liked Black Sabbath, Iggy Pop. Blondie, etc., and uh, Joy Division were a punky thing at that point. But uh, so, and you know, so when it comes to the late 1980s, I'm not trying to push our conversation along here, but when it comes to the late 1980s and that idea that you've kind of that, that summed up in the Stone Roses and yes. the whole Manchester thing, that actually your music is eclectic and you bring all these influences yes. to bear and it's black music, it's white music, it's psychedelic music, it's punk music. Actually, that absolutely fitted where I was and what I wanted to hear right back to that moment when Gosh. I decided that I would go to a punk club but spend my evening in the disco room. That basically. makes absolutely perfect sense when you put it like that, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's Yes, I mean, it's a, a, a sort of refusal to, to stay on one track, a refusal to stay in lane, to, to be aware of all the other lanes and all the other traffic, yeah. and then ultimately when you became an artist yourself to, to pick from, from wherever you pleased. Yeah. We have jumped ahead a little bit, because we go back now to the decision to go to Manchester. Yeah. I presume getting in was a breeze. Because <laughs> I was clever. Yes. Uh, yeah. Whether well, you realised it or it. not. Actually, oh, yeah, I mean, I was... I was, I was I mean, did you, you know, okay, the let thing me, is, hang on, let me rephrase that. Element, question. There was an element of there was an I there was a, you know in this thing, uh, there was an element of nerdiness about right. me. You know, I was quite earnest. I was curious. Uh, maybe I had a, a reasonably good radar of, you know, what what where to go and what to see and what to absorb. But you know, there was a, there was a part of me that was you know slightly. I think I, I was. Uh, intellectually very mature, emotionally mm. very immature. Okay, uh, but so exams are actually not, yeah not not really a problem to me. But th- that was just because I actually just en- <laughs> I enjoyed studying. Why not? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean later on, I you know I uh, you know I always think that of that um, you know Pink Floyd, The Wall. Mm. Uh, you know Pink Floyd as a band. All enjoyed a great education, they certainly did. and they brought brought out a record yeah. telling the kids to drop out of school. Yeah, you know, and yeah. and then then James Brown comes along and he's like, educate yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm I'm I kind of like feel like that was that was good. I was learning my lessons from James Brown, not Pink Floyd. Not Pink Floyd. There's almost yin and yang then. I had never thought of it mm. like that before. Um, so you get to Manchester in presumably 1980. 1980. Bang on. What was it like? Um, Compared to Mosley, well, to be you know, to be honest, I think it's one of those weird things that we have in Britain where we we like to we like to find enemies quite close by, and uh, and uh, I mean, I find obviously in Manchester now, I, I, I find the among some people in Manchester, not all, but they're hatred for Scousers, mm. for example, uh, bewildering because really they've got so much in common. 
so much in common. And actually, one of the great things about being involved in music is you just swerve all that, all that stuff about you know you'd scouse as a different uh, you know. And I have loads of friends in in the London in the Liverpool music scene and the London music scene. So I. I was. I've always looked at the similarities. I've never looked at the differences. So actually, going from Birmingham, where I had an art house cinema, I went to regularly. I had a little venue called the Fighting Cox, where I'd see bands like the Au Pairs and the Prefects, UB40, Steel Pulse, all those kind of bands in small venues, uh, and, I, and an alternative book shop just up the road. I kind of replicated that life in Manchester. And I found that all. And in fact, when I went over to Liverpool in 1981 and I started hanging out with Pete Wiley from a band called Wah Heat, mm. he introduced me to Liverpool's alternative bookshop, uh, photography uh, gallery, little cafe bar, record shop. So that my tribe, as we called it earlier, yes. my tribe is not about a postcode. Clearly. It's not about a postcode, which is weird because, we, you know, we... The, our in our world, there is lots of re, you know reasons going back over centuries of people who create enemies mm. wherever they go, and uh, the Manchester music scene was very small in 1980. I think you know more people bought Dire Straits records in Manchester in 1980 than went to see Joy Division, The Buzzcocks, and The Fall put together, or new, and well, New Order as they obviously were by the okay. end of 1980. So you know it, uh, Manchester's now very, very mythologised yes. music culture in, in that period was that was what that that was the weirdo tribe, you know, the ones in who only went out to clubs in midweek, yes. you know, who who went to hear and and also had their ears open to all sorts of stuff from other international, you yes. know, like Factory Records was very interested in what was going on in New York, for example. Um, so uh, I, I found it, I, 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 again, enjoyed the adventure of finding the bits of Manchester where, uh, yeah, I kind of fa found my tribe, I guess. And then the fanzine, Debris, presumably was an attempt to show other people what you'd found. Yeah, I mean, sharing is really important to me. I mean, I think um, I, I kind of felt like at that point I was in a sharing culture. You know, Pete Wiley would share stuff with me. You know, people I hung out with, have you heard this? You know, have you read this? Let's try this. Um, and uh, so Debris, I mean, a lot of people did music fanzines, but I, me being me, <laughs> Debris also had, you know. You'd be reviewing Don't laugh omelets. at me. I'm Don't not laugh laughing at, at you. I think it's, uh, this was 83, so final year at university. And, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, then, yeah, obviously we... we um, at that point, you know, Thatcher was in full effect. There weren't jobs, really, even if you were, you know, a clever English literature graduate. But I didn't really, that didn't really bother me. You know, you could slip under the radar a lot easier then uh, than you can now. You know, you could sign on, you could get your housing benefit paid. Uh, you, there was a thing that came in called the Enterprise Allowance Scheme that yes. came in a kind of uh, probably 84, 85, 86, um, where you could, the government would basically give you a little bit of money to get you off the unemployment register. And there was, again, a whole generation of people who took advantage of that to kind of hide away from the real world and and do our own thing. So that little Manchester scene actually grew partly partly because people were taking advantage of of uh, of joblessness yes. in a way um making a virtue out of a necessity so what were you do i mean the fanzine was your thing because more obviously people were putting bands together yeah. i think i've read ian brown saying actually that if it wasn't for income support half of the bands that came out of manchester would never would have no, it's, had uh, any rehearsal time no, uh, you it, know, it's true i mean uh, yeah i mean uh, same with happy mondays i can remember them all signing on to the enterprise allowance scheme Aiton uh, street was uh, it uh, yeah yeah and uh, which is <laughs> now a holiday inn yeah, is it, so is where, it? Where, where we all signed oh, yeah. on, I signed on there for in. a while, believe it or not. But um, <laughs> yeah, and then you know Alan McGee from Creation Records, yeah. he was the same. And in fact, he he had a little fanzine. The fanzine was a kind of little bit of an entry level thing that a lot of people did. James Brown, who went on to be the editor of Loaded, Loaded um, and he you know and various and editor of GQ for a while as well. Um, Alan McGee from Creation Records, 
Uh, obviously, going back a bit further, people like Paul Morley, there are lots of people who started out as fanzines. It was kind of what I would now um, call, you know, a cultural intervention. Yes. And it was actually cultural intervention you, you could do if you had access to a photocopy copier. That's all you needed. You get it out. Again, it's that Kevin Rowland jump the barrier. You know, I didn't know Manchester was a long way away from London. And for all my education and my whatever possible, you know, my confidence and my desire, I couldn't write for a magazine. You know, I, I, I didn't know who to phone. How do you write for Enemy or The Face? Or who are those people? They're just things that you find in WH Smiths and you buy them. Right. And the idea that you that you could participate in that world, you know, it was as alien, alien as, you know, getting on stage and being in Iggy Pop's band. It okay. wasn't. So you had to, you kind of stayed local and you stayed, uh, you know, whatever was possible. You, you pushed whatever was possible as far as it would go. And actually just having a fanzine was enough. That was, that was great. I and and, that. and it also opened doors. This is perhaps younger viewers will be, will be surprised to learn that you could then, through the fanzine, set up interviews with people who were famous then, but, yeah, but I mean, household uh, names now. And, and I mean, again, yeah, I mean, keys uh, to the kingdom. Uh, all, uh, all those bands, you know, and all those artists like you know Pete Shelley from the Buzzcocks, Ian Curtis from Joy Division, all those people gave lots of fanzine interviews. You know, uh, it was it was part. Fanzines were an important part of all that. That the kind of the chatter around that and the and the curation of the culture was in the hands of fanzine editors. And, um, and 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 my fanzine also included. Can I used to do things like uh, I interviewed because uh, I I got this haircut quite early on in my life, um, and so I used to have to go and see a barber every two weeks, and it was it obviously it took up a lot of time. And even when I was twenty three, my time was precious in a way. I had stuff to do, <laughs> so I used to interview the barbers. Fantastic. So I, I collected all these interviews, like 80-year-old 80, 80 barbers who'd grown up doing short back and sides and were just so pleased that, that hippies were no longer fashionable because <laughs> hippies never went to barbers. So they were like, yeah, <laughs> we want more people like you, Dave, uh, coming here every two weeks and, and, and paying you a £1.50. And, you know, so, so I'd interview barbers and then there'd be like a piece about, you know, the Russian film director Andrei Tarkovsky or something and... And it was just a, a way to self-express. So this really. was, yes, it, well, this was the exhalation, having spent mm. the previous t- 10 years inhaling yeah. as much as you can. This was, and, and it, that, yeah. that speaks of a certain confidence, doesn't it? That speaks of an, I can now Kind of, or I think it, what it speaks of is that, that further movement from being a consumer to being a producer. And that's really, yes. I think that is, the, that is a really healthy culture, a healthy world of ideas, people yes. turn from being a consumer to being a producer. So you see something happen on stage or, or on screen or you read something and you want to do that and you and you have the tools and there aren't barriers. Or if there are barriers, you have the tools to break them down. And that that is really what a healthy culture is and a culture where everyone's just consuming what a few people are saying is a really unhealthy culture. The participation is so important. And I actually think that came out, for me, that probably comes a little bit out of punk was like mm. that. You know, I always say... But it looks so accessible, didn't it? Looks it looks as yeah. well. Anyone if, could if, do if it. Sid, too cool. If Sid Vicious can yes. be a pop star, yes. or if, in fact, even if Bez can be a pop star, then who <laughs> can't? <laughs> I don't know that Bez was the beginning of a long tradition. Well, Bez was, was Bez the beginning and ev- the end Be- of the Bez, Bez is tradition. That <laughs> Bez is evidence that you can... You can yes, cre- you anything can, is possible. You can carve out a career in, in show business stroke avant-garde popular music yes. with just a dance move and some maracas. Yes, no, you make, you make an excellent point. The, the years in which you were consuming, did you have a sense, and this is again something that, that you, you, you're going to say I don't have a bullet point answer to this, but did, did you have a sense that you were a producer in waiting while you were being a consumer and the fanzine then became the first embodiment of that? Um, yeah, I, th- I think I, I thought that, um, yeah, I thought I could get in in involved and I didn't but the, my, my thing was I didn't think I, I wasn't ambitious 
Right. At all. I didn't think, oh, if I start a fanzine and I write about the right things and I knock on the right doors and interview the right people, one day I'll get a proper job mm. in a proper magazine. I see. I didn't think that. So it was an end in itself. Absolutely, an end in itself. When I started DJing, it was a very, as I say in the book, it just happened by accident. Yes. I was put in a, in fact, what first happened is I started putting on bands in small venues uh, around Manchester, bands that couldn't really get a gig and just needed a little bit of help, bands that I, I liked hearing their demo tapes or whatever. Me and a, few, a couple of other people used to put them on. And, and then we just needed someone to play music before and after the bands. And I was, I was just designated that person. It wasn't like you are the... Di I don't even know... You know, it wasn't like I was the DJ. We didn't really have role models for DJs apart from, you know, the ones who were all pretty you treed up now, you know. <laughs> they were never role models, though. They were never... No, they weren't role so models. So the DJ, the phrase so the DJ, DJ didn't mean anything no, the, except no, them. Except, except them. them, yes. So uh, you didn't want to be a DJ because that was, yeah. Um, I mean, it was radio DJs were different, but sure. club DJs... Um, I mean, on the northern steel so territory, wasn't yeah. It, I mean, the it? northern soul scene, the reggae Different. scene. They had mm. DJs were a very important part of that scene. But on the kind of indie avant-garde, electro-y, whatever scene. It didn't really matter. So, And that's part of what you said before about all the different traditions coming together under dance music, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because it, it, that is very much the, the Primal Scream being a good example, or at least by yeah. the time Scream and Delica, but, but the merging of rock and dance, the merging yeah. of older traditions and newer traditions. And the thing and is that that actually happened before, because I think in the book what I talk about more is... You know, we're used to hearing that, you know, there are TV shows about made about the, you know, yeah. 30 years since the Acid House Revolution, as if one day... It just went off like every, Yeah, every, one day everyone was, like, gloomy and we had Joy Division <laughs> and we had, the, you know, we had, like, a couple of Smiths albums and a fanzine and no one was interested. And then one day, you know, Bez took ecstasy and a guy called Gerald created Voodoo, Voodoo Ray, Ray and yeah, the world right. was changed. But, in, but as a... As somebody who had started DJing in the Hacienda at 86. What sort of stuff were you playing then? I, I, it was um, relatively eclectic, but yes. the thing no, about... No kidding. A bit, <laughs> things like um, 23 Skidoo, um, obviously... Well, I was the only DJ in the Hacienda who ever played New Order. Okay, Because the really? Hacienda was one of those weird things where... Oh, uh, yes, you know, okay. you wouldn't play. Why would you play a record just because it was made by the owners of the club? Of the, club, of course. the one thing about DJ now was the idea was it was different. And did you mix at that point in eighty no. six? So you were just putting one record. Well, on more after or the less. Other. Yeah, yeah. Of, of but course. the programming was very. The, it was really about the programming, right? Because you, although you weren't mixing, you there was a sense that there was um, you you were somehow creating uh, an emotion. Emotions in over people. a long, not not over a long of five minutes time. separate yeah. emotions. So it but wasn't a long... like that kind of like the the house thing where there's like a couple of minutes and a big breakdown. Sure. And everyone goes mental, put hands in the air, and then that is kind of repeated ad nauseum for yes. four or five hours. It was it was about you know how yeah how do you bring people into uh, the vibe you're trying to create? How do you bring people onto the dance floor? You know, how, where where do you take them after that? How do you play a record they've never heard before? Where do you put that in the set? You know, uh, there's uh, uh, and uh, and the idea was just to be different. It was it was just to, ultimately it was just about me playing my favourite records loudly to a group of strangers and just a very big enjoying group. A very that big group. It was a warehouse. Well, it never started. As a, no. We had to build it. I mean, right, we had to course. build the audiences. Because, yes. yes. again, that's another part of the th the story is, is how we had to create and then nurture an audience. It was an interesting thing. It wasn't... There wasn't a ready-made. We didn't have. We didn't know what kind of music we were playing in the book. I have a bit of a, a giggle that yes. someone actually said says to me, "That acid house set yeah. you played was brilliant," and I actually didn't know what acid house was. They were just the records that I was playing that I'd bought that this, week. This is a theme in the book, isn't it? And this... I, I just, I just love that. But so we didn't, you know, that yeah. 
the, I mean, the, the frust- frustration is not quite the right word, but when you mentioned that the bears under the balcony was not the beginning of some apocalyptic explosion, it yeah. was almost the culmination of lots of lots. We're back again to this idea of lots of paths leading to this yeah. this one place. And I said at the beginning, I am very much of the view that it did lead to somewhere unique and truly remarkable, yeah. and for me, genuinely life changing. But I, I get now why you don't like the portrayal of it as being a kind of a, 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 almost a moment of conception. Yeah, because I think the I think the the roots of it all were laid very deeply, um, and you know they were laid in in lots of different kinds of music, musical traditions coming together. I think it was also that uh, what I mentioned earlier about um, the factory and the Manchester scene yeah. being kind of quite open to influences from overseas. Uh, it, that open mindedness. That's the other thing. I mean. Again, I mean, ecstasy in many ways was a, a, a great drug that empowered and enabled lots of stuff to happen in the Hacienda and elsewhere. But it didn't create the soundtrack. No. And and also it didn't, it wasn't, it didn't create, in, it created open-mindedness in a lot of people who wouldn't have otherwise been open-minded. But there were already a lot of people who were open-minded. That was the whole, that was why it was the Hacienda that became the blueprint of rave culture. That's why it happened at the Hacienda, because we were already at that point. Right. We had everything there before the drug. Right. And then when the drug hit, it just went Blew the doors up a off. level. Yes, I get that. That makes sense. And the I, the other element that, that intrigues me, in fact, let's, let's do something a bit different, because we're talking about you. I find you fascinating. The book is fascinating, partly because you find other people so fascinating. So we should probably pay a little bit of attention to the people that you find fascinating. And it's a veritable, it's a veritable who's who. You tell a very poignant tale of your f- flirtation with Tracy Thorne. Is that the right word? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a romance that, never, yeah. that was never culminated. You talk about right, the, the title of the book, Sonic You Slept on My Floor, You Thurston Moore... In, in Pizza Hut, although he yeah. doesn't, when you meet him later, he doesn't remember either meeting, which, you know, he's a busy man. He was busy a, man. Morrissey, I love the bit where you were the only fanzine editor who refused to yeah. bow as all the other fans. Because, I mean, he, he had assumed a godlike status by that point. I mean, you, you, you knew everyone from that um, milieu. Yeah, I did. But, you know, they, they the, the, what, uh, what I mean, I mean, and, and then later on, obviously, I'm, I'm in the book. I get to a point where I do a lot of on-stage interviews in Manchester and I'm in- meeting people like David Byrne, Niall Rogers, Nana Cherry. And um, and so th- those characters I write about are people that I've met over, you know, a period of, yeah, more than 30 years. Yes. And what I still find, there's a few things that I still find fascinating about those people. One is that they people always say, don't meet your heroes. And I tend to only get close to or interview my heroes because I'm not I can't kind of fake interest in people who don't interest me so they tend to be my heroes. Have a lot of heroes and I have a lot of heroes yes yeah. so and, and I also have a lot of heroes that I want to pay homage to yes. and I pay homage to them in the book you know and uh and I would say almost all of them by the end of the interview or the encounter whatever it is that enables me to meet them I I love them more yes the, you know, I'm not disillusioned by them at all, and I, I and 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 I think that's an, an important thing to say because I, th- I do think that again, often in our society, we like to kind of you know drag down people, especially you know it's like kind of you know who do you think you are thing. Yeah. Um, you know, people like Niall Rogers are just amazing people, and Niall, interviewing him, he he's one of those people who he's never take taken it doesn't take because that's the other thing i think people think of successful people as being people who trample over everyone else to get where they go and the only way to get success is to put other people down and exploit other people and find their weakness and then you meet nile rogers and he's worked with madonna and da- and david bowie and he's had multiple hit records and grammys and he's worked with daft punk he's never stepped on anyone yeah. He's got where he's got by being nice to people, by doing quality work, collaborating with people, seeing the best in everyone, and just giving and giving. So when you meet someone like that, it, it, they're inspiring people. 
So they've never, they very, very rarely let me down. And the other thing that interests me about them, which I try and get in the book, is that mix of ordinary and extraordinary. Yes. They're, they're extraordinary people in a lot of ways. But I like the ordinary side of them. And, I, you know, and I'm lucky that, you know, I've had times when I've been sat in a dressing room with David Byrne of Talking Heads for like an, with an hour to kill, you know. And there, you're not showbiz. You're just sat there and you're talking about cycling and chocolate biscuits and, and you know, and just even, you know, stuff that really matters it is as well. The, it's, the, it's the collision of the ordinary and the extraordinary yeah. that fascinates you most, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it it's, is. It's, it's that... Alchemy, almost. Yeah, and I think it's. I think I'm. How I don't really know how my mind works, but I think I'm lucky in that my mind tends to think of everything first as ordinary. Okay, so th- my okay. job is an ordinary job. I'm a DJ. It's an ordinary job, and I treat it like somebody who takes pride in an ordinary job. And the fact that you it, it, you can then be flown to Peru or New York or Paris to DJ or whatever, that is just kind of that's then what happens. The extraordinary part isn't okay. isn't what comes first to mind in in my world. And so when I meet and when I when I introduced Johnny Marr to Nile Rogers, what did they talk about? Tuning guitars. Yeah. Right, that's what two of the greatest songwriters, two of the greatest guitarists of the last 50 years wanted to talk about. Something which, to my mind, is really, really mundane. And I was in a room with them and they were talking about (laughs) guitars. And I was like, I was picking at Nar Rogers' sushi. Yeah. And 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 just like waiting, waiting for them to shut up. But um, so that meeting, but they were having the time of their yeah, lives because yeah. they're finally so, speaking so, yeah. to people on their own level about something that's an intrinsic part. So of they their talk about guitars life. for like ten oh. minutes, and then uh, and then Johnny Marr says, um, and actually they were on the same record together, they, which they recorded different parts in different continents. So they were talking about um, the Brian Ferry record that they were both on, mm. and then um, Johnny said, "You do know Niall." My son is named Niall after you. And so and that was an extraordinary moment. Absolutely. But we'd, we'd done the 10 minutes of talking about guitars and yes. we'd had the sushi. And you need both. And, and, we, and that, that just, that really, and I try and bring that out in the book. I don't really know to what end other than it's that, yeah, it's that mixture which really, really intrigues it me. It's, there's a mixture in you as well, and I'm interested in where you'd put the percentages of the chronicler, the observer, how much of Dave Haslam is the chronicler and the observer, the describer, the recorder, mm. the archivist, and how much is the performer, the producer, the, the artist? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, God, that's a good question. I mean, that's something that... Um, I, I like being a participant in the culture that I write about. I mean, I like... Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm not a kind of... I, I mean, I guess I could have been in another life a kind of academic, yes. writing it quite forensically about popular culture. Postmodern, but, a very postmodern position. Yeah. Yes. But I don't want to be... That doesn't interest me You want to get your hands dirty. Yeah. My favourite time, really, one of my favourite times in my life, even now when I'm 56, is 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning in a club <laughs> with, like, you know, maximum 300 people in a 200-capacity club, preferably a basement, strobe machine, smoke machine. You don't know what time it is. You don't know where you are. Neither do the audience. The music's really loud. They've never heard the music before. They love it. Just that, yeah. that simple moment, because that that's just... I love that moment. Can you remember the first one? Uh, yeah, well, it happens. To me, It it, it those moments just have just kept on happening but the first one when you actually went from being the bloke who's just playing records because you're waiting for the band to start and that would have been at places like band on the wall would it in the boardwalk and the clubs bo- like that. yeah a man alive yes uh, yeah the, i mean i think when, it was, did you, when did you realize that djing had become a performance art well now this this is uh I, I don't i think the first time really it sounds odd but i think it was 1990 what Really? I know, yeah. Four years after you started playing yeah. at the Hacienda. How come? Because uh, um, because up until that point, I was the bloke putting on the records that people danced to. Aye, yes. and, and, and And I 
to me, it was uh, it was a joy, but it wasn't. I didn't realise anything of the cultural significance of it. And then, and then a couple of things happened in nineteen. The Spike Island happened, mm. and and the stone, and that was the third or fourth gig I'd done warming up for the Stone Roses, which I mean they were all great gigs, but there were twenty thousand people yeah, there. Jesus. You know, it was a big, big deal. Uh, and there were camera crews and press releases and all that stuff, which we had not had really before then. You know, we, it, we were underground. Yeah. We were underground people, just as you now get a cultural underground. And our underground lasted a long time <laughs> because nobody was particularly interested and no one could access it. And we were in Manchester. And um, when it did get overground, that was when it suddenly became a big deal. Okay. And then the same year we did a Hacienda DJ tour of America, and uh, and Graham Park, one of the other Hacienda DJs, and I were sat in the back of a limousine going from Detroit Airport into the centre of Detroit to play records. And, and we just, he knows his music just like as you know, the depth that I do. And we just looked at each other and we are like, Detroit is one of the music capitals of the world, if not the music capital of the world. Why have they flown us all the way here and sent a limousine for us to play our ropey selection of Hacienda tunes. And that was us being a bit self-deprecating, sure. but it was also us suddenly realising, wow, this is this is what we've been doing has become big and important. Well, answer that question then. Why did they invite you to Detroit? What, Be- what was going on that was so special? Uh, I think, um, well, Manchester was just, that era was beginning to be talked about and everybody wanted a little taste of it. And and I think what particularly on that, funnily enough, on that tour, we went to, I remember playing the night before in Chicago, and the guy running the club at the end of the night said, we've never had, I've never run a night where we've had such a mix of black and white kids in our crowd and for someone like me, that was a much, much better thing for anyone to say to me than, you know, oh, I love that yeah. weird 23 Skidoo dub yeah. mix that you played. <laughs> you know, that goes without saying that's what DJs should do. They yeah, should play so stuff like that. Yeah. But for someone to actually in Chicago to say that, you you've know... You've broken that, a barrier. Yeah, you've broken that kind of barrier. And I think there were people in America who had, you know, got bored of the kind of, you know, the pretty straight rock thing and 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 rock and house music wasn't mixing in America and there were a few people who were just like us because that's the other great thing James about being a DJ is you travel and wherever you go you meet your tribe mm-hmm. because they're the it's it's the the guys or the women who are running the club uh, they take you to their favorite little hangout of course, come yeah. and have a drink here Oh, you've got to meet this person. And, you know, and I, I can go to, I remember going to Reykjavik for about a day and a half. And I went to kind of like three little record shops, four art gallery openings, a couple of restaurants, you know, and uh, somebody else's club. And then after I finished, I went to somebody else's club. And it was, and there they were. They were people just like me who were living in downtown Reykjavik. And, they, you know, they did want to talk about weird music, but sure. they also. And I just, I love that connection. I love making that connection. And and that's why perhaps more recently, after um, after your marriage broke down, you moved to Paris. It kind of, yeah, it, it, it's, it kind well, of, anyway. Un, well, unspo- My love life unspo- is a lot in the book, but yes, what I do is, is. I, I um, partly because I don't really know what the status of... I, my relationship with Tracy Thorne back in 1983-4 was, for yes. example. Um, and, um, yeah, like an, like anyone really, once they start looking under the surface, I kind of begin to think, what's going on in my life? Yes. Um, so, yeah, things got a bit complicated. And I went off to Paris. Change of air. More input. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, I mean, in, I think in, in, the, in the, the book... It, sort of slightly falls into three parts. The first part is the kind of the, that evolution of all that stuff, me yes. absorbing stuff, but also the the roots of the whole Manchester thing being laid by m- me and dozens of other people, and then it all coming to fruition. And then there's a middle section, which is the Spike Island and, you know, Gunchester, Tony Wilson, all those things, which is kind of the things that I feel like are more 
in the public domain. And yes. People feel like they know that. You know, it's like the, you know the the books that Hooky might write, for example. Yes. So I kind of feel like people know that stuff. So my take on all that is a very honest and personal one. And then, and then the final shocking third, at times. People, I, mean, I hadn't heard the story about you having a gun pulled on you in the DJ booth before. Or no, well, was, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, especially the Gunchester years are quite shocking. Yeah. And actually, uh, you know, getting a proper death threat off a proper. Mean, I'm not. I'm not talking about the. I mean, there was the gun guy, and then yeah. there was a the death threat, and having to deal with by being the kind of guy that you know I was suddenly put into a situation where, by that time, I was running club nights yes. in, at the boardwalk, so I had a, I'd, I had a very high profile, and um, I was involved in in trying to keep, you know, some pretty heavy bad guys out of the club. And it, and uh, and I, and that and my, and my son was very young, uh, and then my daughter was bored, and I was kind of like getting home at two o'clock in the in the morning, and I was, uh, you know, if I if I'd been religious, I'd have got down on my knees and thanked God because they were very very hairy situations, yeah. and so that's the interesting thing about uh, the middle section is the magic coupled with the misery, the yeah. the, the tragedy and the ecstasy. Yeah, <laughs> See what yeah. I, did there. I mean. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the first ecstasy death in Britain uh, in a nightclub uh, was a girl called Claire Layton who uh, was taking ecstasy while I was DJing. Yeah, she was 16, wasn't she? Yeah. So uh, I think in the book you have to be, uh, if you're going to write a book like this, you have to be honest, you honest do. about who you are, what you say, what you saw, and uh, and the complicatedness of life. And so what, when you say about, you know, going to Paris, that was part of the final third of the book. What do my generation do? I don't want to be that. I don't want to walk down the street and people to be like, oh, yeah, he was big in the 80s. You yeah. know, he's hanging on to this, he's hanging on to that. Or even worse, he's milking this, he's milking that. Because Manchester, Manchester can be accused of all that kind of stuff in a way. But actually, it's a very lively, very active, very 21st century city. And a lot of the music scene is as strong as... In fact, there's probably more creative people now in Manchester because a lot of young creatives don't want to have to live in London to do what they want to do. They want to get out. And a lot of people in the north don't feel like they need to go to London to make it. They come to Manchester instead. So, But at the same time, I'm like, well, how do I deal with all this baggage? Yes. You know, all this... Uh, and so there's a kind of, although I don't really explain it like this, and I'm not sure this is the whole truth, but I sell all my records, yes. which is a kind of getting rid of the baggage. It's a kind of, I need to move on. So what do I need to move, move on? I need to lighten my load. So I sell four and a half thousand records, but I sell, sell, sell them to a 31 year old DJ who becomes my best mate and we end up <laughs> DJing together. <laughs> um, but not my best mate, we no, were mates, you know, yeah, and yeah, we, yeah. He, we, he wants to do a festival. And so, it, I, and then I use some of the money to live in Paris for six months. And it's partly to kind of work out what's going on in my marriage, partly because I've always wanted to live in Paris. But, uh, and, and also because, um, Everywhere I went, it was like Manchester, Manchester, Manchester. Right. And it was like, tell us about this, tell us about that. And I needed perspective on that. And I needed I needed to, in a way, go back to the kid who would read f novels from anywhere and music from anywhere. And, and I just, and um, so I escaped to Paris. And it's my, I mean, the Paris chapter which is great because it's no one's expecting it in the book. So Lighting it's kind of quite, for me, it's like, yeah, for me, it's like when you're a DJ, you're playing the big tunes. So you play the big tunes and then you play something which is totally unexpected. And if you're a great DJ, that doesn't affect the dance floor. Everyone goes with you. And that's how the last few chapters are in yeah. my head. Yeah. No one's really expecting me to talk about the lesbians who saved my life, <laughs> uh, which is I just I just start hanging out with lesbians in Paris basically, and I have an amazing, <laughs> um, amazing social life as a result. Um, and and then and and I'm in Paris just after the Bataclan, and then I come back from Paris just before the Manchester bomb. So again, I have that kind of you know as you pointed out before, you you have the the moments of joy, mm. you know, the, the lesbians 
let me de- invited me to DJ at one of their nights. So I was in, in a club by the River Seine, with like 700 lesbians, and I dropped I Feel Love by Donna Summer, and the whole place goes <laughs> mental. And uh, I, I get so carried away, I bite one of them on the arm, and she invites me to Nice to meet her grandmother. It's a great night, James. You really should have been there. I know, sure. But So you have that, but then you have... And that's in a city that is still recovering from the Bataclan attack. And then yes. I come back to Manchester and the Manchester bomb happens. So then I have to really re- assess what what is valuable and what's significant. And, you know, I, and yeah. I kind of begin to ask kind of quite big questions about what it all means. And I, I try and make a link and I talk about, you know, ISIS um, targeting you know, a live music venue in, in Paris and a live music venue in Manchester. And I'm thinking, well, why is that? Yes. What is it about my culture, Yes. our culture, that music culture, that culture of freedom and pop music and weirdos and lesbians? What is it about that culture that so upsets them they need to destroy it? And so I kind of start talking about that and I talk about the res- Manchester's response to the bomb. And, and, and what it does is address two things. It, it addresses ISIS's, ISIS's problem with the with the culture, with the music. But it also, for me, gave a bit of a finger to the people who who like to go, "Why are we singing? Why are we doing yeah. Don't Look Back in Anger?" And the line that that really brings that home is that ISIS must somehow believe music to be an important thing in our society, that music is such an important thing to us, they must somehow feel threatened by it. But following these attacks, music became part of the healing process. And that's what these agitators and provocateurs and and often fairly racist people miss, Mm. is that music is part of the healing process. It's not not a kind of distraction, or it's a balm. Yeah, and and I realised, and that's when I realised that all of entertainments and events of the 40 years of music that I'm talking about in the early chapters actually add up to creating that reservoir that the of hope and solidarity that the people of Manchester drew upon. Yes. And I kind of realised that my experience and the experience of thousands and thousands of other people, not just in Manchester but elsewhere, of 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 being in a club and, you know, being so close to Debbie Harry or Iggy Pop or even, you know, your your mate's band and just being in that moment or being on a dance floor and connecting with someone across the dance floor, a complete stranger, and just feeling that moment of community and communality, that that actually is, some people are threatened by that. And why are they threatened about that? It's about, because we are recognising our common characteristics and our our similarities and our connectedness. And and people in, in our society, some of them, the ones who want to destroy it, they don't get that. They don't like that. They feel threatened by that. And and so, so the kind of it, so the way the book the book ends is it, I, I almost it almost makes me think of again of those moments in the boardwalk where I'm like, well, why am I running a club night where there's a guy guys coming in threatening to kill me, and and then I have to go home and and my two children are asleep upstairs and I'm putting myself in that situation why am i doing it i'm doing it for the all the other people in that club who for them those three hours are not just the best three hours of their week but it's an important part of who they are their identity their friendship groups their community and it all really matters to them and i'm doing it for them as much as for me and you're going to carry on doing it. I'm addicted to DJing. You, you are, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, especially the, other, the, other especially thing, the 4 a.m. till 6 a.m. gig. That, that moment, <laughs> that little moment, because the, the, we're, we're at the end of our time together. It's got, it's felt quite symmetrical. It feels as if we've reached a conclusion. But something occurs to me while I've been talking to you, which is that that you've never had a plan. Mm. And if I, because I often end these interviews by saying what's next, but you've never known what's next, apart from being addicted to DJing. And I mm. sense that if you did know what was next, you'd do the opposite. You'd do something different. <laughs> yeah, I pro- probably would. I probably would. Now, I don't know what's next. I mean, I do want to keep DJing. Of course. I mean, but I don't want to be that, again, I don't want to be that one that I don't want to turn up to a, a gig and there's no one there. Um, because ultimately, that's what about you know DJing. You ha- you hang up your headphones when nobody wants to hear you. And I'm very lucky in that I'm actually a better DJ now than I used to be. And and people still book me, and I still have a great time. And uh, so I'm not going to give that. Up. I love 
um, I love the world of ideas. I don't, you know, writing is a, writing books is a pretty hard thing yes. to do, as you know. <laughs> the emotional commitment and the commitment in terms of time. I find it better than journalism because journalism is, I find the whole, you know, how to get work and what mm. you write about and someone else going to edit your thing and da, 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 it's too much. But I, so I like doing the books because they're my, my thing and they're what I do. But um, I have, actually have got a weird, I've got a weird little challenge for myself, uh, which is that um, I've booked, I've been, I, I, I met this guy, when I sold my records, I sold them to a 31-year-old DJ from Detroit, Seth Troxler. But the other person who wanted to buy them is a guy called Mauro from Parma in Italy, who's just bought an old church uh, in Parma, and he's turning it into an art gallery stroke performance space. And he's booked me in November to do a one-hour avant-garde performance art piece. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to honour that gig, but I have no idea what I'm going to do. I met someone yesterday, a girl from Italy, who was bought one of my books at an event, and I made the mistake of telling her she actually wants to come with all the friends so it's really so happening. an audience now it's building. really happening but I, I kind of like that I just like yeah I think you know you do. I think that comes across we know that the, why not yeah exactly that's my More I, I want that to be my default position as a 56 year old is, is if somebody suggests something to me my default is why not rather than why should I Dave Haslam thank you James thank you ever so much thank you. that was lovely cheers thank you Hello, I'm James O'Brien. Thank you for watching this episode of Unfiltered. Not only is there plenty more where that came from, but there's plenty more to come as well. So make sure you subscribe to Unfiltered and put yourself at the front of the queue for all forthcoming interviews.